What is going on, Charles Botenston? We are going to be talking about a couple steps that you have to get ready if you're looking to buy in 2019, 2020. You got to get your team ready. You got to get your financials ready. We're going to go over a bunch of the checklist items that I have before we even start seeing apartments. The first thing you have to do is understand a bunch of things before you actually go into the process because it could become overwhelming and you don't want to go backwards and then you have to sidestep if you really like a home and you're not ready to place an offer. If you're ready to place an offer, you don't have your lender, your attorney, your how to actually move forward with the revenue financial statement. So let's just get right into it. The first step is get your financials in order. There's three things that they, they, I mean the co-op and the bank, they look for. Number one is your income. What is your income? How much money do you make? That could be from investments, annuities, child support. It could be bonuses. That could be rental income, any kind of income. How much money is coming in and how much money is going out? In other words, going out could be any kind of debt payments. That could be credit card, boat, houses, uh, college tuition, anything that's leaving your bank account. There's obviously see a ratio, a debt to income ratio. We talk about that in another video. You can go check out. The second thing is how much money do you actually have in your bank? So that is post closing liquidity. Once you buy, put down 20%. Once you have closing costs, how much money do you have left over? So that could be, and they don't actually really look at anything that you can't sell on the open marketplace tomorrow. Something you can't sell on an open marketplace tomorrow is a boat or a personal property or houses. It takes a while for that or IRA or 401k, especially if it's restricted stock, things like that you can't just push it onto an open marketplace immediately get money if you have stocks and bond and it's not restricted you can easily get money within two to three days so they consider that post closing liquidity and the third thing is your credit score your credit score will affect you more than people even think about they think about the first two how much money do I make and how much money do I have a lot of people they don't look at their credit score the problem is if you're talking to a bank or when you talk to a bank if you're financing obviously it really affects your credit score I'm sorry it really affects your your interest rate you're going into a co-op they're gonna say what happened five years ago what happened four years ago or why do you have so many credit cards open or why is your debt to credit rating so high you know or why is your credit rating so low they're gonna look at those things number two assemble your team there's three things there's three people that you really need to assemble and we're gonna be talking about it in step three but assembling your team is obviously your real estate agent which we're gonna talk about in the step three real estate agent your bank whoever that is, you don't actually have to go with that lender, but you have to talk with the bank and don't go with a pre-qualification. You have to go with the pre-approval. Pre-approval means they check it out through documents. They run your credit score. There's things behind running your credit score. So if you, you have a bunch of inquiries within a two week period, that's fine. It only dings your credit once. If you do a credit score inquiry and then two weeks later, you have another credit in score inquiry. And then a month later, that's going to bring your credit down because it's going to show all these people are looking to find out what your credit is. What do you looking to borrow so before you actually go to a bank and a lender talk to a real estate agent about when to actually get that pre-approval letter so get the lender ready and obviously an attorney an attorney you have to get ready for and, and by the way let's just talk about that a new York, actually a Manhattan based real estate attorney it's not gonna be in Westchester it's not gonna be in New Jersey it's not gonna be personal injury or anything like that a Manhattan based real estate attorney because it's completely different it's gonna save you so much time and so much effort I'm dealing with that right now you need that regardless of what your friend or, or someone else says, Manhattan-based real estate attorney. So with the real estate agent, let's go into that. It's a relationship that you are entering. You have to have the T word, which is trust. You have to trust your real estate agent. You are trusting them by giving them all of your financial information and, is saying, and saying, what can I afford in a co-op? Give you the difference between a co-op and a bank really quick. So a bank is gonna want your how much money you make as opposed to how much money leaves your bank at 42%. That's pretty high. So in other words, if you make $100, they're fine with 42 leaving every single month. That's not good because that's pre-taxes. A co-op is gonna want it at 29%. That's almost half. So it's a lot more challenging to get into a co-op, most co-ops, than getting a mortgage from a bank. Your, bank, your broker is gonna be able to say, we can't get into this co-op. It's 25% down or it's 30% down or they need a credit score of X amount or we need to know politicians to get into this bank because it's on Fifth Avenue. It's not how much money you have or how much money you make. It's who you know or it's who you are. So get your team ready and obviously with step three is someone you like and trust. You could trust them, but if you don't like them, you're not gonna wanna work with them. It is a relationship for at least three to four months, up to six months, up to a year. Fourth thing, determine your affordability. So there's a lot behind this. Again, I already went over how much money is 
in your bank, which is post-closing liquidity, and then how much you make and how much your debt is. You have to sit down with your real estate agent and there's something called a Rebdy Financial Form. A Rebdy Financial Form essentially just spells out your complete financial picture and are you gonna buy in an LLC? Do you need money as a gift? Are your parents buying for you? Are you buying it for your parents? Are you co-purchasing? Is it gonna be a guarantor situation? There's so many ways to actually purchase in New York City. And again, in condos, it's a lot easier, but it's more expensive. Can we get into a co-op? If we can't get into a co-op, is it a condo? Okay, and if it's a condo, it's obviously, like I just said, more expensive, yet, you know, it's just, a lot easier to sublet, it's easier to renovate. Obviously, you don't have to go through the whole rigor, rigmarole of a purchase application that is just you know dire need of some updating, which is a lot of the co-ops. You also have to talk to your lender about what they're willing to lend, and then obviously, what is the interest rate, what your monthly is gonna be. Interviewing the, the real estate attorney, so obviously, that's part of your team. Real estate attorneys, essentially, it's not about price. Obviously, you know a lot of people, that's all they look at is price. You know How much is this person gonna charge me? But the problem is, if they're really good, they're gonna be worth that price. They're gonna know the process, they're gonna be able to negotiate the contract on your behalf, they're gonna be able to, things are gonna come up. You have to get your team in order, but when you're interviewing your real estate agent, your affordability, which is your which is your lender, and then you go to your, your attorney, there's a lot of people that switch attorneys mid-transaction because one attorney is saying 3,000, the other one's saying 1,500. Well, when that happens, and you're talking to that person for $3,000, why don't you ask that person for $3,000, hey, this guy's at $1,500, why is he worth $1,500? Or you talk to the person that's worth $1,500 and you say, why is that person worth 3,000? It's just like when a real estate agent in your listing, you, if someone's doing it at 6%, another person's doing it at 5%, you say, well, why, why are you at 6%? or you ask the person at 5%, why are you at 5%? Have them defend how much they're charging. That's the most important thing when it comes to not only the lender, when it comes to the interest rate, obviously that's that's also up in the air. HSBC could be at 3.25 and then Wells Fargo is at 315. You know, why are you more expensive? Can you match this rate? Are you giving me closing cost credit? Moving in, step number six is your preferred neighborhood. A lot of people, they say, as long as it's a good deal. There are no good deals in Manhattan. Why, why would a good deal come up? The only time a good deal comes up is if someone really, really wants to sell. It's an estate sale, it's a divorce, they're having a kid, they need to sell to buy. You know, that is so rare out of the 10,000 transactions actions that happened in Manhattan, it's, it's just in, unfeasible or infeasible or whatever, even if that's not a word, it's not feasible to actually be able to find that. You'll be waiting forever. And this is the reason, if you're a seller and you're selling, say, this card, and someone says, I want a good deal on this card, you say, uh, no, actually it's $4.59. I wanna pay $4.59 for this card. You say, actually, I want a good deal. I'll give you $3. It's the same thing with a home. Who's ever selling their home or this card wants the most amount of money. The same person that wants to spend the least amount of money. So the preferred neighborhood, obviously uptown is a little, little less expensive than downtown. So Upper East Side is the least expensive, more, less expensive than the Upper West Side. Uh, Midtown is kind of right in the middle. Chelsea is more expensive. Then the West Village is more expensive. Tribeca is more expensive than any of the ones that I just said. Soho is obviously, you have to say, okay, if I'm spending $2 million in Soho, what is, it, what is, it, what is that gonna get me? That's gonna get me like, I don't know, like a 1,000 foot loft, which is probably gonna be a one bedroom. And on the Upper West Side, that could be a two bedroom in a doorman building in a condo. Or it could be a condo two bedroom that needs work and you have to put in $250,000. It's all relative. Obviously downtown, everything is happening. You have bars, restaurants, nightlife, shops, boutique area, or boutique soap places and candle places. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. And then you have the Upper West Side, which is, it's gonna be more neighborhoody, more trees, okay? Yeah, you're squeezed between the parks, but I. I like the Upper West Side. Step number seven, start going to open houses. Once you have your team, once you have everything ready, in other words, this is what I could afford, this is the area, you start narrowing it down. The best advice that I've ever given to buyers when we first start, or the best advice I do give to buyers when we first start is, it's a process of elimination. It is not a process of selection. A process selection means, here's 50 homes, let's select one. No. A process of elimination means here's 50 homes. How do we narrow it down to the 10 that we want to see, the 15 that we want to see? This one's smaller. This one's not renovated. This one has a doorman. This one has a roof. This one has a pool. This one's near the subway. This one's above a restaurant. You know, the, the monthlies on this are higher. You have to narrow it down and be confident in that. And the only way to do that is obviously have your team, have your affordability, have your area, and then you start looking at uh, the property. Once you find the property, you have to go back to your mortgage person and say, 
is the building approved on the approval list of your, on your, your bank? In other words, there's a lot of buildings that are not approved. And the reason they're not approved is because they have a mortgage is too high. They don't have enough in their reserves. They have pending lawsuit. They have too many people are renting out their place. There's too many sponsor units. There's too many rent controlled, rent stabilized tenants. There's a plethora of reasons that banks are not willing to lend because the risk is too high in that build. So once you discover a property, I had this multiple times. You know, we say, hey, listen, you know, we work with someone at Wells Fargo. Hey, listen, her name's Alyssa. Hey, Alyssa, look at this. Is it worth it? Can we actually get lending in this? And then we make an offer as long as it's on the approval list of Wells Fargo. Sometimes they need just uh, documents and, and you'll be fine. Then you bid on the property. This is where you need the, the real estate agent. A lot of people say, you know, I, I, I feel it's worth this. Yeah, that's not how you negotiate. You have to negotiate with this one sold versus what yours is worth. This one's on the market or this is how the market is. There's a lot of inventory. So obviously your home is not worth that. It's been on for half a year. Your home is obviously not worth that. You have to bring in practical if it's in the seller's marketplace it's totally different but when it's in the buyer's marketplace you have to bring up practical ideas it's not what you feel it's worth you have to prove it's worth that negotiating a lot of people don't want to do that okay they, they don't want to sit in silence they don't want to negotiate they feel uncomfortable with it they don't want to ask for the terms that they want that's why you have to interview a good real estate agent so once you bid on the property you go back and forth you obviously have the closing date, you have your lender ready, you have the pre-approval, you have your Rebby financial, it gets accepted. Then you start going into the contract process where you put down 10%. Once you put down 10% and sign the contract, then you start going over the purchase application. Purchase application is obviously a very intrusive, just where a lot of people start getting very emotional because you have to, you only go through the co-op process once, but once you're in the club, which is the co-op, you're fine. You have to be prepared to be just scrutinized on that one bankruptcy or that one foreclosure, or why do you have so much debt? Or why do you have so many homes? Or where's your income coming from? Is it international? Is it not? Why are you buying an LLC? What's your company? Why, why are you posting a loss for your company yet your income is $500,000? You have to be able to prove all of that through documents. This isn't just here's, here's what I know it's worth, even though I tell the IRS something different. Moving on, got to prepare for the board, which means board interview. So board interview is a, it, it could be easy, it could be hard. You know, if you have a very good tight purchase application, they're just gonna say, who are you? Are you good for a building? And what, what about these financial questions that we have? Hopefully you've taken care of them before you actually go for the board interview. And then obviously the days before closing, you have to go in, check out the property, make sure it's, it's still the same property that you signed the contract on, and then you move on to the closing, and then you've bought a new home. Obviously that is a three and a half, four month process if it's a co-op from beginning, which is getting your team assembled all the way to the end. If it's a condo, it could be less, it could be two months, two and a half months. And obviously if you're financing, you're gonna cut off about 30 days because there's an appraisal process, application process. It has to go through underwriting and uh, just a, a, a lot of rigmarole. They also have to clear to close and you have to have the bank attorney at the closing. So there's there's it's totally different once you start financing. Obviously your bid as well, if there's a multiple bid situation, it's completely different. There's multiple bids on it. They're, they would rather take cash or they'd rather take not contingent over contingent on financing. Totally different videos, but that is the multiple step process process. If you guys have any questions, leave in the comments below. Charles at Botenston is my direct contact. And as always, shoot us an email on what you want us to talk about. All these things we, we write about is from your feedback, which is I'm looking to buy this year, or I'm looking to sell this year, or I'm looking to uh, hire a real estate agent or attorney. What do I look for? What are the questions I ask? We'll put out the videos. We'll make sure that we give you valuable content. Have an amazing day. Again, as always, if you have any questions, leave in the comments. Shoot me an email, Charles at Botenston. Talk to you guys soon.